Good evening, and welcome to the Enoch Pratt Free Library. My name is Vivian Fisher, and I am Deputy Chief of the Pratt Library Central here at the downtown location. This evening's author, Dr. Lawrence P. Jackson, needs no introduction. A native Baltimorean, Jackson joined the Johns Hopkins University as a Bloomberg Distinguished Professor in the departments of English and History at the Krieger School of Arts and Sciences. He has recast the study of 20th century African-American literature and culture. He is widely known for his extensive scholarship in this, this field, which includes biographies of Ralph Ellison and Chester B. Himes, as well as a narrative history of mid-century writers. Jackson's creation, creative nonfiction work is focused on structural foundations of racism and inequality. He writes persuasively about the historical forces behind unrest in the city of Baltimore, including mass incarceration, housing segregation, and disparities in health care and education, and inter interrogates the dis the, the and interrogates the discrepancy between the city's rich history and its current record levels of poverty and alienation. He is the author of the award-winning books, Chester B. Himes, A Biography, Indignant Generation, A Narrative History of African-American Writers and Critics, My Father's Name, A Black Virginia Family After the Civil War, and Ralph Ellison's Emergence of Genius, 1913 to 1952. Harper's Magazine, Paris Review, and Best American Essays have published, published his criticisms and nonfiction, to name a few. Professor Jackson earned a PhD in English and American Literature at Stanford University and has held fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Humanities Center, and the William J. Fulbright Program. He began his teaching career at Howard University, and he is now the Bloomberg Distinguished Professor of English. His latest books are Hold It Real Still, Clint Eastwood, Race and the Cinema of the American West. And since he's such a busy scholar, he also wrote Shelter, A Black Tale from Homeland. Both were published this year. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jackson this evening to discuss his latest works, Hold It Real Still, Clint Eastwood, Race and the Cinema of the American West.
I have to. Oh. Can, how's everybody? Okay, you can hear me. I have to keep writing books so that I can get more introductions from a one of a kind, Ms. Vivian Fisher. So thank you so much. Um, it's been a pleasure, uh, you know, knowing you over the years. And uh, this is, um, I've, I've given an address in this room before. Uh, so it's a, uh, it's a pleasure actually to return. So I just, you know, you can get the gist of the remarks this evening, really, if you see what's on the screen. I don't know if anybody recognizes this uh, image uh, to uh, my right, your left, but the far image is an image of um, African-American, it should be cavalrymen, right? But uh, African-American soldiers, and it's in the town of Towash in the absolute middle of the Clint Eastwood film, The Outlaw Josie Wales. And the consensus of scholarship, well, uh, some, some, I think, really important work. And my own perception of the film was that there were no African-Americans in it whatsoever. So you have like the, you know, it's the tada, the denouement uh, of, the, uh, of the project really is that, you know, this is showing that there's actually an interesting logic that goes on in multiple um, uh, cinematic events uh, that uh, perhaps characterize so much about what we think about, you know, the United States, American culture, American masculinity, and especially this film genre, the American Western. And I'm, I'm trying to, uh, to look at it anew or to look at it um, somewhat differently. Um, the, the, again, the remarks that I make, and I will, <clears throat> you'll get kind of a lecture tonight because I do have these slides and I want to get through them. But uh, the, the, the remarks, I would just say, they are, they're in a spirit of discourse. They are not um, uh, 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 final stops or resting places. And uh, one of the things that's sort of funny to me, and I say this in the acknowledgments of this book, is that this is, this is sort of like my, my kind of like my morning coffee meanderings as I would like look at the newspaper. Like if I get the New York Times or one of the newspapers, um, the Baltimore Sun doesn't doesn't often give you so much on the national or international side for a particular kind of reflection. But this, these are the, the, um, the kind of the, uh, the, the joyful analyses that um, you know, would sort of come to me at that moment. I still think of myself in my heart of hearts as a, as a literary biographer and a person who is like, you know, sort of invested in the mid uh, 20th century, uh, working right now on a, um, uh, biography of Billie Holiday and her parents and grandparents and early uh, or early 20th century, late 19th century Baltimore history. But today we'll talk about um, Clint Eastwood and the title is drawn from precisely that moment in the film where uh, the uh, photographer is uh, capturing the, uh, the black soldiers and I use that word, the pun deliberately, and he says, hold it real still. And then, uh, you know, there's a two seconds um, in another shot, and then that's it for them in the film. So the question that I was asking, right, kind of like these, uh, uh, I don't want to say big questions, but you know, just things that we wonder about. Well, how do, how do history and politics work? But especially, how do we remember and recall things? And you, know, you look at our contemporary political discourse, um, you know, it's important, maybe it's important to remember or to know that I had drafted pretty all of this prior to um, the uh, conflagration in the United States in, in 2020, in the spring and summer of 2020. But um, I, was, I was pretty convinced that most Americans, and certainly this was true for you know, the entirety of the, uh, the public government's uh, presentation of American affairs during the Trump presidency, you know, was that um, really, uh, civil rights had taken place. Um, American race relations were, if not in a good place, were in the best place that one might logically expect them to be uh, permanently. And uh, I think I even have a slide of this later on. You know, you'll remember these 2003 Supreme Court decisions where uh, the Supreme Court, like, very grudgingly would say, well, some of these policies at the University of Michigan, um, you know, um, the California state legislature would ban any kind of preferential admission, you know, period. But some of these uh, policies that would treat race, but especially people of African descent would um, enable, you know, some kind of preferential admissions treatment. They might be necessary for another 25 years, but after that, the, um, the, the, the conditions 
will have fundamentally changed. And, and it's just fascinating to me, you know, you can sort of pick your point and turn to, um, I wouldn't call them narratives, but you know, turn to a legal decision, uh, turn to an act of Congress, um, turn to uh, something that took place in the nation state um, itself. And uh, you have these uh, moments or these uh, places, you know, where you could have, you know, like extraordinary optimism or um, sometimes, you know, sort of other uh, uh, narratives would emerge that might be a little bit more pessimistic. Um, I wanted to, I'm, I'm foregrounding with my, with my uh, you know, sort of list of what takes place, like from the Brown decision or actually from the integration of the armed forces with um, President Truman from 1948 through the 1960s, because I want to think about a term or piece of language that's uh, really, really important, or that I find a lot of um, lot of use. But anyway, you know, these would be sort of touchstones of American history that we might all be really, really familiar with. Maybe we're not thinking so much about the 1968 omnibus crime bill. Um, but, um, you know, what happened in the 60s? What was the transformation that took place? And so then, you know, like in the world of uh, 2020, we're thinking about the, uh, the Republican convention and uh, different arguments, and I, I'll, I'll go back and forth, but just so that you can see, different arguments about 2020 and the, uh, the presidential election, uh, please, uh, please come in, or, you know, or if you can, come in. The uh, arguments about, um, whether or not uh, the Trump was a racist, the Republican Party was racist, a conservative American was racist, or appropriately recognizing uh, different touchstones in African American history, or uh, 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 you know, just a, a ton of different arguments about black belonging, and then also with the January 6 insurrection, uh, three quarters or more than three American media, right? Um, you know, and then. Uh, ongoing. And often these, 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 um, the logic of what we were being presented would turn around, you know, um, do you actually see uh, people of African descent? And so, you know, like, did you see Black people on January 6th? And, you know, I found it fascinating that you actually do see, um, you know, the protesters. And I'll make a confession. I was actually, I was going to go to the, um, I don't going to go out to the mall because I wanted to see what was going to happen. I was fascinated by it. I wound up having a um, professional commitment and I could not go. Um, and then also connected to this thing about the, uh, the uh, Republican convention, you know, sort of in, uh, where was it, folk? Was it in Tampa? Where was it? You know, I, I just have forgotten it, but, you know, and, and I saw more black people on the screen than what seemed to me like they had ever seen before in any political convention. I mean, I thought it was absolutely astounding. So in other words, I, I was uh, a bit bewildered or I, I used these examples, you know, to um, sort of suggest that there's, a, there's an opportunity for other bewildered, like what we see um, doesn't seem to bear any relationship with what we know to be true or the, uh, let's say, the functioning of different political parties, wealthy people, uh, group of wealthy people. Um, and, and so some of this for me, the project, also an attempt to, um, as the uh, red, rhetorician and uh, language philosopher Kenneth Burke said, to produce some equipment for living, to um, try to help uh, with some of these problems. And some of the language that I wind up using, this is, I, I wind up being more on the Marxist side of analysis when I'm introducing these terms. But I, I, I found myself really uh, more interested in terms like ideology and hegemony um, than at any other period. And, and, and in the work that I've written, Ideology really is just about the capacity for imaginary relations. Um, and, you know, sort of what is the, the glue that uh, enables us to have this capacity to imagine things, imagine connections, especially with people, with people, places, ideas, concepts, but that we don't have, um, you know, uh, uh, anything tangible to sort of fall back on. And then hegemony, of course, the, um, the Antonio Gramsci term 
about this indirect rule, and especially rule that seems, um, uh, or especially subordination, that seems natural. Um, it seems common sense. You know, um, uh, when I was a child, with um, discussions with my parents who were both born in the 1930s, you know, they're Depression era children. And I always marveled, I would say, I mean, you know how the cruelty of the young, my young person won't even come into the room, he's over there. They're completely cruel, right? Unconscionable. The cruelty of the young, you know, I'd say, how could you all, you know, have sat still for that segregation business? Like, why would you, you know, whatever, 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 you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting this stuff in school, right? And, uh, uh, my dad would always say that it was conditioning. Um, it was conditioning. It was um, not so much a question of challenging something, but understanding it to be the the right place, the 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 uh, the right action. The proverbial uh, step off of the sidewalk. Uh, the proverbial step to the back of the line. Um, but anyway, I found those uh, terms and language. Um, of increasing interest um, uh, to me. And then also I would say, also say something about ideology uh, or why I'm finding it useful. Remember that this was the, um, in some ways the, the term um, comes about because you have the scientists saying, well, you know, we have scientific fact, this thing that we can prove empirically um, this experiment that we can run. And then you have this thing over here, which is ideology, which is this belief that does not operate according to any particular rules, right? But it's helpful to us because I am concerned that we uh, are also, and you know, I mean, I hope to show or may maybe say a few things that are rather daring. I am concerned that we're also um, doing some easy moralizing that will not help us ultimately. And I would just give you, you know, I mean, this is a, an abstract sort of example, but you find today more than, you know, I can recall at any other point, people saying, oh, you know, if you, if you believe, you know, you can sort of take your pick, right? If you believe this, you're on the wrong side of history. So that is like a profound, I mean, you know, again, we're, we're, you know, the academicians, okay? You know, we're living in a, in a certain kind of bubble, right? But we would say that is a profoundly goal-oriented, destiny-oriented, teleological understanding, right? That suggests that there is, um, you know, somebody has identified where this utopian place is taking us, the, the capital H history, and we're all on board for it, whether we want to go or not. And um, my suspicion is that um, those uh, uh, quick, uh, uh, um, uh, automatic, um, maybe not as fast as knee-jerk, but ultimately knee-jerk nonetheless, those conclusions won't ultimately serve us with some of these problems that, that we, I think that we indeed have. And I'll just throw this out, out there. Um, it, I would love it if you all would tell me how much time has gone past, because like my computer doesn't have a little time on it. Or maybe somebody back just... 2019. Yeah, we're going to go a little bit faster. So, you know, again, pardon me. But I, I you know, you can see on the screen, my colleague, Veshla Weaver, is uh, one of the United States leading uh, political scientists, one of the globe's uh, leading political scientists. Uh, she teaches in poli sci at Johns Hopkins. And she's come up with this term front lash to help us understand what took place in the 60s. And she says we make this error when we think of it as backlash because we're not able to see the programmatic nature of what was going on. But basically, the, uh, the Congress people who were opposed to uh, the 1954 Brown decision, who were opposed to the 1964 Civil Rights Act, the 65 Civil Rights Act, they immediately, in advance, I mean, so it's in the 1950s, it's in the beginning of the 1960s, they immediately moved to the uh, criminalization uh, uh, judgment or assessment, right? The problem, not in, not by 68 and the omnibus crime bill, right? The problem in the early 60s was that the civil rights activists were criminal agitators, was that Southern black migrants moving to urban America were criminals. And that uh, you know these uh, senators and Congress people from Philadelphia, and New York, and Massachusetts, where you know they had the highest crime rates in their black neighborhoods, right? And that that was the um, 
the the agenda. I'm so happy that we have in the audience Brother Davon Love, who has you know been like a super figure. Of, what do they call the people from Marvel Comics, DC Comics, right? In our own region, has done heroic work to turn this uh, back. But I mean, you know, we all have to be helping uh, Brother Davon because this has been like a long, you know, 60 plus years orchestrated uh, 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 maneuver. So, you know, hey, anyway, how do I get to this with the, uh, the thing about the outlaw Josie Wales? Well, I was also fascinated that um, Eastwood had his own uh, purchase iconography as a, a political figure, a figure that was bringing together, um, you know, we have this debate, like, is it fine arts or is it, you know, just sort of uh, lowbrow, uh, you know, genre film, right? Is he just, you know, sort of B-movie actor? Uh, but nonetheless, uh, bringing the arts and politics um, together, but certainly uh, this is a figure who had been uh, turned to uh, multiple times, um, actually, as a possible political running mate. I think it was, uh, they were imagining perhaps that, um, uh, maybe it was even George Herbert Walker Bush, but that at some points earlier on that he might have been a possible, you know, vice president, <laughs> candidate, candidate Eastwood. Um, you know, we got Arnold Schwarzenegger instead, right? You know, uh, but uh, because he's not American by birth, right? He couldn't aspire to, you know, sort of higher elected office. Um, but Eastwood there at the um, 2012 uh, presidential uh, 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 campaign for Mitt Romney with the iconography of the outlaw Josie Wales behind him. And of course, this idea about Josie Wales, you know, um, this is how I opened the book. It does not, this course introduced, and I'll get into this in 1976 with the film, it doesn't stop there. It actually goes into these other dimensions of global popular culture. So you have dance hall figures in Jamaica who say, look, I am Josie Wales, right? I describe, uh, you know, walking on the streets in Boaque, in Cote d'Ivoire, right? We're not on the coastal, the Abidjan coastal city, you know, three million inhabitants. We're in the center of um, Ivory Coast in Boaque. Uh, you know, where the remnants of the civil war that has taken place, right, are still visible to the eye, right? And walking through the street and I have a random conversation encounter and the man says, Clint Eastwood, say mon père, right? That's, you know, that's what I'm about, right? It's like Clint Eastwood. And, you know, you see people with the uh, T-shirts of Bob Marley and Samori, and uh, uh, Che Guevara, and it's sort of like, you know, the, um, the iconography is very, very Pan-Africanist, very, very um, uh, 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 decolonization, anti-colonization, but this figure about uh, masculinity and public uh, and popular culture is always, you know, right alongside Michael Jackson, but particularly as a representative of the United States. I found it fascinating, and then, of course, you know, you have to rappers there at the Super Bowl and, you know, uh, Snoop, Snoop Dogg. And this is another person who in his um, aspiration for a particular kind of uh, uh, imprimatur or public image of toughness, you know, associates himself with, you know, sort of the Eastwood figure. Now, prior to getting to uh, the outlaw Josie Wales, which to me is like this fulcrum point for the American Western, uh, Eastwood had, um, participated in, if not, I mean, he didn't inaugurate the, the this uh, shift in American um, televisual culture, but um, certainly he was right at the, you know, apex of the curve in producing these vigilant, vigilante styled uh, police officer figures. And, you know, I would just say that the point is, I do a little bit of a reading of a couple of the scenes you, I, I, what you wouldn't, I would say, you wouldn't notice, like if you were watching Dirty Harry, right? You might notice that it was sort of like, you know, he shoots down the bank robbers who were kind of supposed to be like in the Symbionese Liberation Army. You remember the Patty Hearst kidnapping? But at the same time, there's another frame where you have three black painters dressed in white, whitewashing a wall. It's it, like, it's phenomenal. I mean, you know, it's like, it's, it's absolutely amazing. And as you know, like, this is what we do as literary critics. I mean, we spend the whole book just like on that juxtaposition. Like, what, what, what is the director and the uh, producer, what are they trying to accomplish? But the thing that's fascinating is that when these films come out, right, and Eastwood produces, uh, uh, it's a, 
I think it was ultimately it was five films, but in the 70s, it's a trilogy. Um, uh, this is this is at the great transformation of American uh, television culture, right? Where you know you're going to move to like 75, 65 to 75 percent prime time television shows will be uh, police dramas, right? We're still at the same place, so it's a it's a fascinating uh, transformation of uh, of um, American culture. Um, uh, if, uh, I should say that um, I have to pay homage to uh, uh, not quite a teacher of mine, but somebody who was actually completing their major works when I was in college, and I rely on the work of Richard Slotkin and his ideas uh, in Gunfighter Nation and the relationship between the work of art and politics very much. Um, fascinatingly enough, uh, Richard Slotkin has, you know, he's taken, he lives in Baltimore now, so he's no longer in Connecticut. But uh, one of the fascinating insights that he makes in his work is that he, he emphasizes the point that the Western film as a cinematic genre is absolutely its great rise in the 1950s, where the majority of primetime American cinema major releases, like 50%, are Westerns because it has such a strong relationship to the U.S. Cold War. And uh, I can't remember exactly where I have my slide. I think it's coming up. Um, John Wayne is going to be the major figure from the 1950s. I mean, actually from, you know, 1939 Stagecoach and then these important films at the end of the 1940s. But in the 1950s, John Wayne will, uh, you know, become the, uh, the epitome of American box office stardom. Uh, and we will be moving, though, from that period uh, it, 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 who would have been able to predict it in sort of like an ebb and flow? Um, I, I think this slide is coming up. Just, uh, I'm sorry, I gotta go, gotta go uh, to, to get you there. But you will be shocked when you find out how many Western films are being made or in production um, today. So uh, one of the things that's fascinating about this, uh, you know, completely new, completely different kind of figure that John Wayne was. Um, was, you know, the way that he embodied, um, you know, sort of like American masculinity and patriotism to the point where he's going to be the recipient, you know, of multiple honors from uh, Congress and from uh, the, um, uh, the, the president. And it is maybe especially because of some of his comments in the late 1960s, you know, where he would say things like, uh, you know, I don't believe in equality of the blacks until they're educated up to be able to participate in democracy, right? You know, this idea that black people are like fundamentally degraded in a um, strong way. But that nonetheless, Wayne, um, in my view, represents through in the cinematic uh, uh, earth, represents this um, concept of racial liberalism. And I'm drawing from, uh, especially from two people's work, um, Lonnie Gunier, and uh, Jody Malamud, but just um, this this idea that uh, you know we would have um, uh, 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 stressing the damage of racial segregation. I mean, it's very similar to what Kenneth and Mamie Clark are doing, and you know perhaps more similar to what um, something like uh, what Daniel Patrick Moynihan will say. You know, a little bit a little bit later uh, in the 1965 Moynihan report. But this idea that um, you know, uh, uh, American democracy is functional and flourishing, and if, um, you know, uh, sort of appropriate actions might be taken, then, you know, black people, I mean, this is what's behind the 1954 decision, black people might be made ready uh, for basically an assimilation project. Um, in fact, it's important to recall that uh, to get everybody to vote for the uh, Brown decision, you know, when you read uh, the, um, the decision of the more uh, conservative uh, members, you know, they're saying, look, segregation worked much better than we thought it would, right? It went faster than we had decided. And now black people are ready for full citizenship, not like uh, segregation was, you know, an injustice, crime against humanity, South African apartheid. Um, but what's fascinating is the, the, uh, the concluding point that I have in bold, um, state-sanctioned anti-racisms 
have repressed counter-nationalisms and deflected criticisms of U.S. global power. Um, so there, uh, the, the racial liberalism and liberalist praxis of John Wayne, it has very much a, a, a counter um, to it, right? Um, it is, um, like I said, I, I think it's appropriate to suggest that it is in effect um, gesturing towards assimilation as the, uh, the best possibility. Um, the figure, and, 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 and absolutely, you know, Wayne is not ignoring, um, it, it, you know, it's, uh, again, uh, Blacks, Indians, uh, Latinos, uh, even some in the 1950s, you know, I think what we might understand as mild gestures towards like what, what could later be understood of as almost like an inchoate feminism, right? Uh, you know, the, um, this, is, this is the 1960s, but the man who shot Liberty Valance um, does come to mind. Um, you know, the, but the figure who as the African-American uh, racial liberalist star was uh, Woody Strode. And these are all in the collaborations with John Ford. I mean, Woody Strode was a, was a company, you know, a John Ford company actor. Um, but, uh, you know, if you look at these, um, these portraits, um, I suggest that the portraits are indeed quite uh, sympathetic to and similar to some of the things that we might imagine, I would say, you know, there's a there's possibly an error or a misreading on our part, very similar to performances of black subjectivity in our own uh, cinematic moment. Uh, and I have on the screen, you know, sort of this uh, one piece of language from, um, you know, the uh, maybe Strode's uh, signature film, um, Sergeant Rutledge, and it, it, there's a there's like a fascinating misstatement in the film, like where the logic of what he actually says on screen actually goes counter to you know what he needs to say or what seems to have been the scripted um, word. But um, in any event, you know we um, I leave that, you know you say go out and take a look at the film. Is it uh, Woody Strode? Uh, you know his own uh, subterfuge and intervention or, you know, sort of counter discourse at an important moment. But it is a fascinating um, take on, you know, sort of the politics of like um, assimilation and patriotism in the early 1960s. Okay, I did the wrong thing. Sorry, I'm sorry. I think I can, I think I can figure it out. Mm, if I can get a thing over, okay. Classic. And what one of the points that I find to be like really amazing is that, uh, you know, if you, especially if you fall prey to the idea that, well, you know, the representations in the 80s and 90s are superior to the representations in the 60s and 70s, and the representations in the 2000s and 2010s are head and shoulders of what was, you know, available in the 80s and 90s, right? So again, that also is another sort of a teleological uh, view, right? Like we're on, we're like an arrow being shot upwards. I mean, we are, we are improving and increasing as distance from whatever is our greed upon nadir. Um, but I would, one of the things that I find fascinating is that uh, actually I think that the 1972 film, uh, The Cowboys, uh, gives you an opportunity for a more progressive reflection on, you know, however you want to understand it, uh, race relations is an antique term that has a particular kind of intellectual baggage with it. But however you would see uh, the portraits, cinematic portraits of people of African descent on the big screen, but especially in Westerns with someone like John Wayne, as opposed to or contrasted uh, with Morgan Freeman's portrait as Ned in... Um, Unforgiven. So you, you can't who you can't resist that, right? You can't resist that. It's, uh, you know, so now it probably won't be able to stop. Okay, so uh, if I was better, you will. I would be able to show you clips, but I just am not that far technologically. I'm sorry. I, you know, I'm gonna get there. I'll get there. You know, I'll, I'll be 75. I will, I'm gonna try to get there. Um, if you if you think about some of these portraits, 
um, and especially when we move to Eastwood as the person who will overtake uh, John Wayne by uh, the middle 1970s, and Wayne will die, you know, at the end of the 70s. Um, you know, you you begin really with Eastwood. I mean, or for me, not so much with the television show uh, Rawhide, but rather with these uh, what they call, you know, it's, it's a it's a derogatory term, the spaghetti westerns. But these these Italian directed, shot in Spain, typically shot in Spain westerns. And it is um, the moment when actually the Italian directors will be producing more of these Western themed films than will be shot in the United States. And uh, the reason like, well, you know, one to play the um, signature uh, tune uh, is because it's by this um, uh, uh, musician and, uh, you know, sort of director of music for the films, um, Morricone, who is also working with uh, the um, the uh, 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 the most interesting film project that I would say, I would say is done by um, Italians in the 1960s, you know, which would be the Battle of Algiers, and so immediately in 65 and 66, with the work of these Italian uh, directors and writers and film producers, you have a you know just an incredibly um, it's not just intriguing, it's politically aggressive. It's a vanguard um, politics, but especially to the issue of decolonization um, that is um, you know, sort of alive and well uh, in the Italian film scene. And that's what, East, that's what launches Eastwood as a major um, figure. So it's doubly fascinating that by the time you get, a short period of time later, 10 years later, Eastwood actually directs and produces the outlaw Josie Wales, um, you know, is being welcomed as the new John Wayne, um, the icon of our culture, captures both sexes. Um, you have what I think must be understood as um, a, a, um, a superficial portrait of um, uh, uh, racial diversity and social justice with these remarkable insertions that are, you know, say um, that are its opposite. And especially just to, you know, again, sake of time, I could go on for three hours. I'm not. But, uh, you know, anyway, sake of, sake of time. But just to point out that one of the fascinating things, that, and I will immediately go to what this uh, film project is based upon, but that Eastwood is uh, inserting into the script a couple of key dimensions, and they are the massacre of a white family by um, basically Kansas abolitionists, you know, the, the descendants of John Brown who were conducting the border war against the slaveholders, the war of bloody Kansas uh, between Kansas and Missouri, and then a massacre of disarmed Confederate soldiers um, that, uh, you know, sort of continues. There are two examples of the blood feud that fuels the animus of the protagonist Josie Wales, right, played by Clint Eastwood. So you couldn't, you know, it's like you can't, you you can't um, uh, make it up. So the film is actually based on the novel Gone to Texas, written by Forrest Carter, who was the speechwriter for George Wallace. And in fact, he leaves the Wallace, you know, the the abject white supremacy presidential campaign of uh, 1968. Carter's gonna leave the Wallace campaign because Wallace is getting soft on the issues, right? He's buckling to the pressure or, you know, he's not, he's not as committed racist. Forrest Carter is supposed to have not only uh, been the uh, responsible party in the beating of uh, the singer Nat uh, King Cole in Alabama, but also the castration of a black man in uh, Alabama in the 1950s. I mean, he, he is, is, you know, there's hard to move away from this as being a reprehensible figure. Um, turns himself into uh, a published author and will go on to considerably greater frame, fame as the author of um, a, uh, you know, a work where he presents himself as Native American. Um, but these, but, but, but what, you know, again, what's remarkable is that the film actually, actually magnifies, you know, however you might understand a white supremacist reading of Missouri in the Civil War and then Texas, you know, shortly after the Civil War and then uh, freedom uh, uh, to Mexico. I hope I have a moment to make a comment about that. 
But um, you know, I would just sort of remind people in the in the in the book that you know you look at the sources and the sources are so um, they're at our fingertips today. You know, in other words, like the records of the Union and Confederate armies during the Civil War. I mean, like the regimental returns. You can you know almost like with the click of a button, uh, University of Michigan, University of Texas, they have digitized you know thousands and thousands of pages. You can pour through and read the reports that are coming in from different you know parts of the United States. And you, you know you can also uh, keyword search uh, Negro or you know slave or enslaved and look what comes up um, in these reports. Um, but I would uh, insist or you know sort of call to your attention and again for the sake of time I just sort of move on that the famous massacres during the Civil War of African Americans um, you have to look at the work of Favolia Glimp. I think uh, the book is called Out of the House of Bondage or Out of Bondage. Um, the Bolia Glimp is the person, uh, professor of history at uh, University of North Carolina. She, she may have moved over to Duke University, but I know she's in Durham or Chapel Hill. Um, she's the first person who uh, said in, in my hearing that it was a consistent feature of um, battlefield um, after effects. The Confederate soldiers were massacring women and children, black women and children. But the massacres that we know of um, during the Civil War are really of um, black people who are sometimes black troops who are surrendering and uh, their families who have fled to forts to escape uh, the conflict. The most famous is at Fort Pillow. Um, and these are all massacres or tend to be massacres and wars of the West, sometimes, you know, but mainly on the western side of the Mississippi. Right. And, uh, you know, the uh, this this um, charnel house of the conflict that is not uh, especially um, uh, at the forefront of our consciousness about what the Civil War was or you know how it ex exactly took place. And I think one of the things that we should remember is that it is in Missouri uh, where the, um, the, the problem of the escaped uh, enslaved person, you know, it initially comes to to the forefront. So it is a, a you know sort of a major uh, 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 crisis. Enslaved people of African descent um, in the West, in Missouri, and then the the couples of enslaved people to Texas. Right, Virginia is supposed to sell off about a hundred thousand people to Texas. You know, roughly between 1860 and 1865. As you can imagine, right, that is it's three times the Trail of Tears, right? That is a, that is a, a it's an extraordinary uh, forced migration, and so you know the film's interest and in management of historical events, you know, I think is uh, is quite significant. The um, the the uh, what I mentioned at the beginning. The, the characteristic understanding of what the film is doing is by the scholar Joseph Lowndes. For a public cut between the militants of the new left and anti-war movements and the emerging right in the 1970s, the reconciliation between Josie, the anti-government outlaw, and Fletcher, the government official, could be an easing of the political tensions of the era. But this is only possible insofar as blacks are made completely absent from the story such an absence is peculiar and seems forced in a historical depiction of a journey from Missouri to Texas at the onset of the Reconstruction. But the introduction of even one black character or even an extra would call into question the heroism of a protagonist who fought not just against an oppressive government that had indiscriminately wronged his family, but also for a society that was defined by its devotion to slavery. So that's the, you know, sort of the classic reading of the film. And, and as I say, this was my reading up until uh, about uh, four years ago, five years ago, until, you know, I'm like screening the film before class, or we, we, we may have even been looking at a scene in class, and I said, oh my, you know, this is, this is different than what I had seen before. What's going on? Why are black troops here? In, it's, and it's actually, it's like the literal middle of the film. Why are black troops um, here in the film? And, uh, geez, geez, I'm not sure now exactly how it worked. But I did, I did have a moment then to understand that there were black soldiers in the good, the bad, and the ugly as well. 
So you can imagine, easily, most of the outlaw Josie Wales is shot in, a good portion of it is shot in Texas. I think most of it is shot in California. Uh, in 1976, it was not a great strain for Eastwood to pick up the telephone and call the casting agent and say, okay, we need, we need 20 African-Americans to play these soldiers, right? Um, Sergio Leone is shooting in Spain. Well, I'm, not, I'm not saying that it's like, you know, black people are absent from Spain or Italy or France, but he is thinking about the presence of black troops in an even, I would say, in an even more deliberate way. And yet, if you can see the, um, the center frame there, at the exact middle of the Good, the Bad, and Ugly, which is a three-hour film. Um, but at the moment when you are supposed to be torn, feeling sympathy for the bandit outlaw, uh, he's a mestizaje figure, Tuco, Benedicto Ramirez, or are you feeling sympathy for the Confederate troops who are in stockades, almost something like a concentration camp, you know, just bearing in mind, of course, that the film is going to be shown in Italy, you know, and it's designed for an Italian audience before coming to the United States. And then right at this moment, and you know, so to see this smug soldier puffing on a cigar, and he says to the Confederate musicians who, you know, are, are being forced to, to play while brutalization occurs. Like it is, it is the, it's an absolutely clear analog to the musicians at the concentration camps, right? You know, you have these trained violinists playing as uh, uh, Polish Jews are getting off of the trains at Auschwitz, right? And it is, so it's supposed to be, you know, sort of like a, 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 a very, very similar moment, right? But we, at the, at the precise time where we're, we're sort of like saying, oh, you know, the union guy is a scoundrel and, uh, you know, he's a brute. We see in the background um, people who have just been recently freed and are in the union army and it calls into question, you know, a lot of the ethics and the logic of that film. Um, once you can see that black troops are really there. At the bottom is a famous um, photograph of a group of uh, Confederate guerrilla raiders. American uh, is one of the um, one of the raiders. But the the point that um, that I you know try to drive home in the uh, the book is to suggest that, you know, it's like a series of containments uh, that are encouraged. And we see that in the language. We see it in the fact that the only moment where we have African-Americans is at this place of uh, photography and photo photographic capture. And that the instructions from the photographer, the only on-screen uh, directions that you hear to the black soldiers are hold it real still. And then you have a series of photographs that are then shown immediately after. And the photographs are of uh, Confederate guerrilla cadavers. And that may have been a, a tradition out West, or it may, you know, the circulation of the, the wanted men who had been shot down. But some of the most famous photographs that would be circulated um, in the um, uh, uh, post-war era would be of black bad men who are often, you know, being pursued as these train networks are, you know, sort of going on all over the United States. But um, the wild bills of uh, the 1880s and 1890s are always being, uh, once they have been caught and shot or executed, are always being circulated, as were the pictures of lynchings being circulated. And then into the 20th century, as were the pictures of people like the uh, Haitian uh, insurgent and freedom fighter, Charlemagne Perrault, um, who was captured and slain by US Marines, as are those images being, you know, like uh, cards being traded. And, and then of course we have, their more contemporary analogs with the, um, with the war on terror. Should we stop for questions? Yeah, I for questions. Tell me, uh, I, I'm, um, the, the the like I said, the project goes the project goes on. It um, uh, I, you know I can I like to connect it to the Bakke decision, um, or I think it's very helpfully um, connected to the Bakke decision, which is also a front lash moment. I got to show you this because it was only two days ago. I mean, I know that I saw Ronald Reagan, nineteen eighty one. I probably did not watch the inaugural celebration when Ben Vereen came out in blackface and performed as Burt Williams.
I couldn't, I had to revisit that for you. I couldn't resist that. Uh, the film I'm suggesting in the book goes on to create the, um, the sensibility and the attitude for the emergence of uh, the new right uh, that will, you know, come, come, come to pass after the Baki decision and into uh, the, uh, the 1980s. Um, we see the tropes of the cowboy uh, circulated, I would say, you know, sort of endlessly, right, ad infinitum. And this was the slide I was talking about. We are now, uh, you know, producing or have in production, uh, you know, like 600 of these films, right, since uh, 2010. It is an extraordinary resurgence of the genre, uh, which in 1979, 1980, you know, everybody's saying, hey, you know, this thing is over. I mean, the great failure of Michael Cimino's Heaven's Gate, which is a film that's about uh, social class exploitation and also includes African-Americans. Um, but uh, the emergence of uh, the decline of the Cold War and the emergence of the war on terror have given us um, incredible purchase to the Western. Django Unchained by Quentin Tarantino is the greatest grossing Western of all time, $430 million. Um, and my reading of the Django Unchained film is to draw the connection out uh, uh, the black exceptional, uh, the um, uh, 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 um, exceptional racial epithet is what uh, the um, the character uh, played by Leonardo DiCaprio, um, Calvin Candy, you know, consistently calls uh, Jamie Foxx's Django. Uh, but to draw the connection between uh, that portrait of a uh, certain kind of black exceptionalism, its emphasis on surveillance and targeted assassination, and then the actual practice that we see of uh, uh, Barack Obama as the president of the United States. And there are specific moments in that film, Django and Chain, um, which I try to treat you know, on its own terms as a work of art. Uh, I am very fond of the Adolf reading of this film, you know, which would be to absolutely dismiss it as you know, sort of uh, debilitating cultural trash. But I would just point out that there are a number of moments in the movie where the filmmaker is like very, very deliberately wanting to call it out for its allegorical dimensions. You know, that, uh, hey, here's a film uh, that is, uh, you know, giving us access to contemporary events, right? You know, the Skittles on the floor and the way that we would recall uh, the, uh, the wrongful killing of uh, Trayvon Martin. But um, I would say that, uh, um, uh, the thing that I think we should really pay attention to is the um, the trap of uh, black exceptionalism that is extolled in the film, and then the um, the unleashing of uh, the surveillance state and the military state in our 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 own period, but especially over the last uh, 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 twenty years. One of the figures I was just sort of going through some of the notes. One of the figures is that. It's, 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 it's like uh, $8.5 trillion spent uh, in uh, military affairs uh, since uh, 2002. Like, in other words, like a, a, a money that is, it would be impossible for a human being, even a human being created system to keep track of. And that's the thing that's so fascinating about this film, right? Is that the Django does actually not kill the slave owner, right? It is his, um, his, his teacher in essence, right? It is like a, a battle between uh, white men. Um, Django kills, um, he kills the, the poor white, uh, Billy Crash, but uh, he kills Stephen, the, the house Negro. And um, uh, that's also fascinating to me relative to the one person who winds up being assassinated or the head of state who is actually executed uh, during the um, uh, end of uh, Obama, uh, Obama's um, first term, uh, which was Muammar Gaddafi, who for you know whatever you might say, was one of the most provocative and loudmouth proponents of, of uh, Pan-Africanism, uh, which was also, you know, sort of quite fascinating. And I'm drawing this from um, the uh, Syracuse University um, scholar, a lot of, uh, a lot of um, his work. Um, uh, 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 and I would love to take some questions. So, you know, thank you very much. <laughs> sorry, sorry, yes, Horace Campbell was trying to think. Sorry. 
Uh, it won't amplify in here, but it'll allow our hybrid audience to hear something. Raise your hand if you have a question. It'll be open to the mic. Oh, sorry. Okay. Sorry. 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 I was okay. So, um, so based off your research on the Cowboys movie, um, are there any movies where the black man isn't in a servitude role or isn't like a best friend where they kind of are the main leader, they do their thing, and then the movie ends? So, the um. Definitely, yes. Um, so, you know, there are, um, I, 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 uh, I was getting ready, I was having this argument with, um, again, one of my young people, and I was saying, hey, you know, I'm a film scholar. Now, to make a disclaimer and say, well, you know, I'm not like super film scholar, but uh, the, the earliest African-American directors are doing Westerns, and those films, the silent films from the teens and the 20s, you know, are absolutely uh, worth seeing. Um, the black exploitation. The thing that's fascinating to me about the great success and the 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 attention and the homage that black people pay to Tarantino that I find is fascinating is that even though he's supposed to be a, like a, such an extraordinary film buff, for whatever reason he disregards um, uh, the most profound black films that are produced in the 70s. Or, you know, he's supposed to be somebody who's like really into um, black exploitation genre. But anyway, uh, Thomasine and Bushrod, which is the second film after Gordon Parks Jr. does Superfly, he does Thomasine and Bushrod, Max Julian and Vanetta McGee. It's an extraordinary film, right? I mean, it, 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 is, it is absolutely countering um, systematically, you know, how, um, the, the, the criticisms that we would come up with against these 1950s and early 1960s racial liberalism epics, right? You know, that the, in some ways they're promoting racial assimilation, uh, that the black character has to be subordinate to the white protagonist and lead. You know, I think that this film, uh, The Manage That Liberty Balance is very important, right? But in, throughout the film, you know, you're constantly wondering, well, does Pompey believe that he's in slavery and slavery is over, but he's just acting out the role or, you know, you can't understand like exactly what the relationship is. And then, uh, you know, uh, also it is very worthwhile to um, look at the Fred Williamson vehicles, which are not directed by an African-American, the legend of uh, racial epithet of uh, Charlie. You know, I think they clean it up today and they say the legend of Negro Charlie. Those films are fascinating. You know what I mean? Again, the, the, uh, the racial politics, the gender politics, um, the legend of Brother Charlie, we got Brother Charles Duggan here with us, right, Brother Charlie. The legend of Charlie uh, begins in Africa, right? And you see, uh, you know, the war breaks out, the child is taken aboard the long boat and, you know, rowed out to the ship. Um, you know, uh, the, uh, the en enslaved people on the Virginia plantation are, you know, trying to figure out whether or not it's time to revolt or, you know, what's the proper strategy? What, how do we keep our families together? You know, the questions that are consistently being asked. And then, of course, you know, Buck and the Preacher, um, the uh, Ozzie Davis and Ruby D vehicle. I mean, these are 70s films. Um, those are all, um, you know, I would say very important and, you know, should be in, in, in so many ways like the foundation of our tradition. I have actually, I won't say anything about this, uh, what's the contemporary movie um, that, that uh, Idris Elba is in it? How do they fall? Um, thank you. So. Uh, I would say um, um, The Harder They Come, the Perry Hensel film starring uh, Jimmy Cliff and uh, later with the, uh, the novel by uh, Michael Thelwell, uh, that should be inserted um, as well. Um, that one is uh, incredibly significant. Uh, in the heart of they fall, they are in Kingston, in the cinema, in you know, 71, 72, watching the Corbucci film Django. And so, you know, you have a whole series of significations. And so then the 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 um, the connection or the conjunction with the contemporary, the harder they fall, and you know, sort of an all-star cast. 
um, 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 like an allegory of the all-star cast, right? The real historical figures. And then, you know, we get the uh, many of the A-list Black Hollywood actors today. Um, that one, too, offers you, um, I think, a lot of useful opportunities to see um, Black representations outside of uh, uh, stereotypical portraits. Is, is that what you were asking? What are the films? Other films? I was going to ask you about the film Glory, starring Matthew Broderick, but I thought maybe I would see if you made reference to it in your book. And you do, but I d I'm not sure that I understand the point you've made. Uh, uh, that it, I think it was an unfavor unfavorable reference. Yeah. Uh, the problem I would and, say is that the film is just about Matthew Broderick, right? It's just an overemphasis of Broderick. It's a Broderick over and over and over again. And uh, to the point where, you know, it's like there's almost no significance of having the portrait of the black troops. And then on top of the fact that, and even with the small time that the black soldiers would get, the small screen time that the black soldiers would get, that, you know, they felt so, it was so necessary to sort of work through a series of stereotypes about black fear. I mean, which was what the, uh, uh, that's what the newspapers are saying in the 1860s. Oh, the blacks won't fight. The blacks will, you know, sort of collapse when they're faced with uh, the uh, the white soldiers in the field. They don't know arms, you know, and that they that they they with a limited amount of time that they actually have, you know, like to to present the film that they would, you know, just sort of go through those things so laboriously. It just I think that's an accurate representation of what you're saying about the film. I did see the film. And I thought it was a film very, very critical of the United States to send, deliberately send a black regiment into sure death in a, a futile attempt. And Matthew Broderick was appointed to conduct this battle. On the other hand, uh, the criticism of the film, of what the film was trying to say was this very stupid thing that was done, and black people were the victims of it. Matthew Broderick's also the victims, but here they were uh, ordered to attack, I think it's Fort Sumter, uh, in the latter part of the war. It's, it's had, not Fort Sumter, but I, yeah. It's not Fort Sumter. It's not Fort Sumter. Fort Sumter. Some, some fort in the South. And they had no chance of winning. It was sure death for just about everyone involved. And the meaning of the film to me, was entirely different from what you're saying. Uh, we have contrasting views of what it was doing, which is which is great, right? Which is great. Uh, it's important to understand that uh, of the almost 200,000 African Americans who are, you know, joined the Union Army, uh, that they're going to have casualties, uh, soldiers who died, uh, more than 67,000, and of that number. It is only about 3,000 soldiers, maybe 4,000 soldiers who died in, uh, in combat, right? That the soldiers are going to die uh, because of the brutality of the treatment that they received. You've got soldiers who are in Missouri as one place who are marched through the snow in winter without shoes. I um, mean, these would be, you know, sort of the callousness towards black life was true, you know, not just with the Confederates, but with uh, Union as well. Well, this was a, a deliberate killing of these black soldiers, they, the order, they, they had no chance of succeeding. Like I said, we have contesting views, um, but maybe if, if there's more, if, you, if there's another question, maybe we just have time for somebody else. Yes, you briefly mentioned uh, Mamie and Kenneth Clark. How do they fit into all of this? Uh, the point I was making was that um, when you have the doll studies, uh, that uh, it is an, it's, a, it's a dimension of racial liberalism, right? That they are trying to prove that segregated schools are, are destructive because it uh, imparts or infuses a negative self-conception for African-American children. And it's a, it's a complex point, or, or um, rather there are... Um, Complex consequences from that point. Um, the uh, I think I had the quote up. Uh, uh, Harry Truman at the Black Convention in 1948 says, "Look, I don't believe in social equality, right? I don't want to 
misrepresent myself, right? To the audience and the color friends that I have, uh, they want to be with their own people. Uh, but this question of is a school its majority black and uh, will it inevitably give black children, uh, you know, sort of a poor self-conception? Um, that's one that we continue to debate today. And, the, you know, the main reason we debate it is because uh, the, um, in, the, in the STEM field, uh, the historically black colleges and universities are still producing the overwhelming majority of the graduates that have gone to medical school and PhDs in STEM fields. Um, that there is, in other words, like there's a, there is a self-conception that is uh, possible in all black environments that seems to be hotly challenged and contested in majority white, white environments. I mean, again, that's a, it's a, it's a maybe um, uh, uh, um, a, 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 a speedy and a, a general conclusion, but, but, but that's the, 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 the dilemma with the, the success of the Clark Dahl studies or part also um, begins the process of the elimination of black institutions. Yes, sir. I can talk. Oh, oh, this is for the yeah, They gentleman. want to hear you on the internet. Oh, I'm sorry, excuse me. <laughs> the gentleman's point about the senseless killing of the black soldiers made me think of, and I can't remember the title of Tennyson's poem, where the famous quote, yours is not Library? charge of the light brigade. Yours is not the reason why yours is but to do or die. And so often, even today, we know that the senseless killing, we reflect, as my cousin was saying, different analogies, just like even with the Vietnam War, when some of us were protesting that at the time I was in school, because we didn't just want to be blindly sent to our deaths. You know, Muhammad Ali and uh, Gil Scott Hearn and others had told us no Vietnamese had ever called us a nigger. So why are we going to fight somebody when, you know, as he's showing here, I was just thinking one other thing real fast, Larry, that the Cowboys whole concept, a lot of the violence we see today with some of our young people, that whole cowboy Absolutely. and violent, you know, gangster, the bang, bang, shoot them up thing in a lawless society. So when Trump and others told him make America great again, there was a lawlessness. It was only through the humanity of the black people that a, a lot of it was tempered. So uh, I think it's very timely because even to have a, like in your introduction to the book, when you said the uh, brother from the Ivory Coast said that Clint Eastwood, I don't know if he had said that earlier, Clint Eastwood was his father, you know? Right. So if, if he's going to be that much, you know, affixed to out of his culture and heritage, then we know we got to bring our youth back around. Thank you for such a wonderful, informative presentation too, sir. Thanks for coming. So thank you, everyone, for coming. And let's give Dr. Jackson a Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. So we have Dr. Jackson's book on sale over here for the bookseller. And we have Dr. Coming up. So thank you so much for coming out this evening. And Dr. Jackson will sign your books. Dr. Jackson will be signed right back here. So folks could just line up. Uh, Mr. Poe here. Uh, 